Our moderator today is Emily Crockett, who is one of our staff writers at Campus Progress. Hello, everybody. Microphone's working. That's good. Uh, so, uh, first we have Heather Boucher, who is a senior economist at, at American Progress. Uh, her research focuses on employment, social policy, and family economic well-being. Uh, her research has been published in journals and covered in Washington Post, in New York Times, where she's called one of the most vibrant voices in her field. Uh, and then we have Zed Jelani, who is a senior reporter and blogger at thinkprogress.org, which also is a member of CAP, as many of you probably know. Uh, he's a co-editor at the Georgia-based blog, Georgia Liberal, and a regular on RT America's The Eliana Show, and Tom Hartman Show, and has been a guest host on Al Jazeera English's The Stream. So, uh, welcome to both of you. Glad to have you here. Um, so why don't you just start by telling us a little bit about um, what you, what your job is. <laughs> um, well, I'll go first. Um, so, uh, as you said, Emily, I'm the uh, CAP Senior Economist. I do a lot of work sort of looking at what's going on in the economy and talking to policymakers and the press. I probably speak to a member of the press um, virtually every single day. Um, and so a lot of interaction and trying to help frame um, the the narrative about what's going on in terms of the economy and what policymakers are thinking and what we need to do next. Um, so I have a lot of uh, interaction with the press, but mo much of it both about the economy but also my own research. Yeah, so Think Progress, basically, uh, you know, we're the blog at the Center for American Progress. And we, uh, you know, we tackle the big issues of the day and we actually spend a lot of time interviewing politicians and doing the sort of political reporting that often, you know, raises hackles. Uh, from people who disagree with us, so we, we're definitely out there, um, you know. And uh, if you if you ever want to find some of the most uh, you know aggressive interviews, you can go on our site and definitely check out the sort of things that we do uh, on a day in day out basis. I was just looking at your site before I came in here today. <laughs> Indeed. Um, so, you know, political journalism is kind of a dizzying and complicated field. Uh, you know, it rises and falls with the news cycle. Uh, you're constantly confronted with bias and spin, and you have to sort of try to find the truth and also your angle. Um, Think Progress, of course, is more of an attack dog, as, as, uh, as we talked about, um, you know, with the aggressive interviews. So, so how, how, do you, how, how do you find your, um, well, said, how, how do you sort of find your stories, and how do you balance, um, you know, look, looking for, you're, you're being a journalist and being an advocate at Think Progress? Yeah, so, you know, in terms of how we find our stories, I mean, we're a blog, so obviously we're sort of on the second layer of news, which means that we typically sort of are following on a news story that's already happening. So everyone's talking about, you know, let's say Mitt Romney's tax plan. So we want to find a way to put a progressive perspective and insert that into sort of the narrative talking about Mitt Romney's tax plan. So, you know, we'll talk to someone like Heather and, uh, you know, sort of figure out the numbers, like how much does Mitt Romney's tax plan give to, you know, ordinary people and how much does it give to super rich people. And then, you know, that's a really great factoid for us to insert into the debate and frame uh, you know, around a blog post, you know, after we talk to some experts and after maybe we talk to someone in Mitt Romney's campaign and ask them also to sort of defend what they're doing. You know, a lot of that um, also, it, you know, sometimes we're not on the second layer of news, sometimes we're on the first layer of news. You know, like, for example, when we asked Hermie Cain if he would appoint a, you know, Muslim person to his cabinet, and he said he wouldn't, and that actually ended up uh, in the CNN debate, and he was actually put on the spot, and three months later he actually apologized and said, no, you know, that was the wrong thing for him to say. Um, so, you know, we're, we're definitely out there finding what's already in the news, but inserting a progressive perspective and, and sort of na changing the narrative around the major topics. Um, you know, as far as, you know, balancing being an advocate and being a journalist, you know, I think the thing about Think Progress is that it's very upfront about what it is. You know, it's a progressive news source. You're not going to come there to learn about, you know, how, you know, providing affordable health care to everyone is a terrible thing. You know, you're going to go there to learn about, you know, uh, social justice, about, you know, expanding equity and opportunity. And I think, you know, the way that we balance it is that even though we have a perspective, we always stick to the facts. You know, we don't name call, and we certainly don't make things up, and we're, we're very much grounded um, to the reality of what's happening, and our reporting is very tight. So I think that's how we balance it. I'd agree with that. Um, and so, so Heather, uh, you, you're, you're a researcher, um, but you also do some occasional writing. And, you know, maybe some of you in this room, you know, maybe you'll end up doing journalism, maybe you might end up doing some policy advocacy. That might be a thing that happens. So, so how um, how how do you uh, how, how does that work for you on a daily on a daily basis with your? Well, you know, a big piece of it is 
uh, doing the kind of work that Zed talked about, like looking at the numbers and then trying to figure out how you can get into, uh, get the important stories into the news cycle and that you can get the kind of take on them that is actually accurate and that furthers a policy agenda that is what we're working on here at the Center for American Progress. Um, so one of the things that's actually most challenging is um, especially dealing with uh, right-wing press, um, or not just right-wing press, almost any press. A lot of journalists, when they call me up um, or they have you on television, you can tell when um, they've gotten exactly what they need because that's when they'll say, okay, thanks, and then they'll hang up on you. Um, and it's interesting sometimes when um, I've kept somebody on the phone for you know 20 or 30 minutes because I didn't what I what they wanted wasn't what I thought was accurate or what we wanted to say, and repeating the same thing over and over again until we're both super bored, um, but not getting to that point where you say things that aren't actually true or that um, aren't consistent with uh, the work you're doing. So. Um, so often it's um, people want me to say things that aren't um, you know, consistent with the data and it's a lot of sort of pushing back on that. Mm -hmm. And uh, talking about sources for a minute, that can be a challenge, especially for a young reporter. Um, how do you, Zed, how do you find your sources? Um, how do you interact with them? You know, a lot of it is, is just a matter of getting to know people. I mean, it might not be that, you know, for example, uh, let's say a congressional office, right? Um, you know, there may be someone who I talked to once on a story six months ago, and I didn't find anything that interesting from them. But then later, I'm, you know, I'm talking to them, you know, six months ahead in the future, and there's a, a sort of a news story, and the, the congressman that they that they're working for is sort of you know pivotal in that story, and I, I've already built the trust with them because they came to me six months earlier, and, and you know, it wasn't as interesting a story, um, but I've sort of built the relationship, and and uh, over time, and this is the same in any sort of interpersonal relationship or negotiation. Over time, you build more and more trust between people, and you can reveal more on both sides, and you can kind of get the information that you need to sort of advance your material. I mean, it's the same way with sometimes think progress material is used by members of Congress or, or by people in other nonprofits or think tanks. And I think a lot of that is just a matter of fact that we put a lot and a lot of effort into building the trust over time with people and sort of showing the strength of our content, what we can provide for people, and how we really put forth a strong message and an accurate message um, from think progress. Yeah. And so what, what kind of, what are, who are some specific kinds of people that you might deal with that, that you have maybe some strategies for getting to, maybe, maybe, maybe press secretaries or uh, people like that? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it totally differs, uh, you know, versus what kind of story we're trying to do. I mean, for example, a lot of what we do is we sort of uh, try to approach right-wing politicians, right, and sort of talk to them, everyone from Herman Cain to Steve King uh, to Mitt Romney, uh, Chuck Grassley, so on and so forth. And I think a lot of what that requires is just sort of going into the situation um, in, in not really an attack dog manner, you know, going in really friendly and professional. And even when you start asking questions that you know will make them sort of you know, uneasy, to, uneasy to answer, being very polite. You know, you can be firm and polite. And I think that's something um, that a lot of people, I think, have a hard time mastering. But, you know, over time, it, it's exactly the kind of skill you need if you want to be an aggressive journalist. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, politeness indeed. Um, any any suggestions for finding, for, uh, for for getting your foot in the door for the youngins? Uh, if, if if you don't really have many connections, what how how do you responsibly, you know, report a story with getting both angles? If you have maybe someone who's not willing to to, to take you seriously initially, I think a lot. You know, I I've actually been surprised as far as who will be willing to talk to you when you reach out to them, and never. And I think the first rule of this is never. Imagine that you're not going to be able to get a response, or that you won't be able to reach out to someone. At least make the attempt. And, and it's really, and particularly after you report, uh, report a lot of stories and break really good um, sort of news, I think you start to build the credibility where people will actually start thinking, if they don't talk to you, it's worse for them. You know, the story comes out a lot worse for them if they, if they ignore you and you, you know, it's printed, you know, they would not, uh, they decline to comment or, you know, they refuse um, to, to respond. I mean, those sorts of things. I think over time helped build up Think Progress's credibility. I mean, when it was, when it launched in 2005, you know, very few people read it. Um, you know, I think that there were a lot of sort of snarky comments from like the Fox News types. So I was just a blog. Why is it reporting this? But I think Think Progress, you know, the strength of it is that it just kept up. It just kept breaking really good stories. It just kept um, inserting really important facts into the narrative. And over time, people, I think, just got. Uh, they thought it was a lot worse for them if they didn't respond and they didn't take us seriously. And you know, for people who were working for like a small blog or a small publication. You know, I would just say you'd be surprised who people, you know, press secretaries for politicians will tend to respond to you. I mean, if you're working for a campus paper, you might have a circulation of 
are 10 or 20,000 people, and you know they want they want young people to be on their side. They know that those are the future voters and future influence makers, and I think that uh, you'd be surprised. So continue, just just keep going and keep at it and be persistent. Well, and I'll add to that because um, I'm on the receiving end of a, a request like that. Uh, is to make sure that the that you that you're persistent and you do your ask, but you also have a very clear ask. I and mean, too often, um, when I'll get emails from students or from uh, campus papers, they are and this this happens across the board, but um, you don't want it to happen if you're younger. They're, they're sloppy. They don't have a, a clear signature line. So I don't know who this person is. This is you know Joe so and so at Hotmail.com. Well, I don't know who the hell you are, and why would I? Um, why would I call you back if I don't know who you're reporting for? It's not really clear what you're doing. Um, basically, you know, you're asking somebody to take time out of their day, um, if they're a press secretary or they're an expert or whoever they are, to respond to you and doing all of that homework up front and being really clear on what you're trying to get and why they should talk to you um, is a really important piece of the puzzle. And capitali capitalization helps. <laughs> yeah. Sort of springboard off of that. Um, what are some, let's look at best and worst practices uh, of, of both interviewing and being interviewed. What do you, uh, what do you want to do? What do you want to see? What do you hate to see? Like what a journalist done that you absolutely can't stand? Any, any particular stories that come to mind? Well, I've got a couple. Um, <laughs> one thing that I think is really challenging is when, um, so yeah, so since I'm an, ex I'm an expert, um, I usually know more about the topic than the person who's calling me. And what can be enormously frustrating is when the journalist is very close-minded and isn't, um, you know, they have a particular angle. And that may be with political journalism, you know, you're sort of, you're trying to make a political point. Um, and so you do have a perspective, but, um, but making sure that you, uh, that it's very frustrating to be on the receiving end of that where the point that um, I'm trying to make or what I'm trying to communicate is not, you're, you're getting sort of a, a wall there. And it's like, well, why, why, why do I have to talk to you if you don't actually want to hear what I honestly have to say? Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of it is also, from a journalistic point of view, knowing who you're about to interview. Um, yeah. You know, I, I think Heather probably gets frustrated by that a lot when people come into it and they just don't know what they're talking about. But you know, do, do your background research before you ever you interview someone. I know if I'm interviewing any congressman, um, you know, I, I'll just read up about them, read up about their history, about their point of view, about the sort of legislation they sponsor. I mean, that's, that's very, very important. And also, um, particularly in some of your interviews, you can be very quick to scare someone off if you're going to come across as just being opposed to them. You know, for example, I actually went to a rally by um, an Iranian op opposition group called the MEK. They're actually um, listed under the State Department as a terrorist group right now, and they're, they're advocating for getting off that terrorist uh, list. And so I went with my, my friend, who actually happened to be Iranian as well, and we were interviewing people. And I, it was obvious that to me that I didn't know enough about Iranian politics, because I'd bring up some Iranian opposition figure, and I'm like, oh, we hate that guy. That guy just smears us all the time, and they'd stop talking to me, right? Um, so if I had done a little bit more research, I could have gotten a little bit more out of them. But you know, that sort of thing can go a long way, just a little bit of, like, you know, even a half hour, just spread that time out and do nothing else and just research the person you're about to talk to and that can help a lot. Great, great, definitely. So um, how, how do you, uh, with political journalism, a lot of it is horse race driven, a lot of it is sort of moment to moment narrative. How do you find yourself um, within that? How do you either follow or break through break free of the traditional narrative and you know as a policy expert how do you sort of integrate yourself into that narrative or, or try to change it you know I think a lot of it is just the, the fact that you're bringing something up that's really super important that would catch a lot of people's attention that isn't being brought up and you know the, the example I brought up earlier about Herman Cain I think was really important in that in March of 2011 Herman Cain was really a nobody I mean he was gaining traction slowly among conservatives but Nobody was asking him tough questions because they didn't take him seriously. So we decided to ask him a really important question about civil rights. You know, would you appoint you know someone of the Islamic faith into your administration? And I think that really inserted us into the news cycle. Um, you know, most major cable news networks covered it. He came up in the debates, and eventually he apologized. And I think we actually that was a, a real flashpoint in, in in sort of the debate. It's just the fact that we brought up an important issue that we know a lot of people care about that hasn't been brought up. When we brought it to a prominent person. Um, to where when they responded, it had to be covered because you know he was becoming a sort of a force in the campaign, but he still hadn't gotten the scrutiny that he deserved. And we, you know, on the policy side, we do a lot of work um, 
not necessarily fact-checking, but going through the data and the numbers um, and the, the concepts that people are throwing out there and trying to push the conversation to be a little bit more substantive, which can mm -hmm. be difficult to get that, you know, get that into the mix, especially as you get closer to the election. But certainly, um, you know, we tend to focus on doing a lot of charts or graphics or ways of explaining, you know, what the tax plans are, what these policy ideas are, um, you know, so that people can have that conversation alongside just the, you know, what the polls are showing. Mm -hmm. So um, one thing that we all have in common up here is sort of Occupy, uh, in, in a way, or, or, or inequality. Um, I slept at Zuccotti Park. Zed has written a lot about Occupy. Heather writes about inequality. Um, so how, and, and it's sort of a, a strange topic. It's, 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 it's an unusual topic in the news. You don't really have traditional leaders to talk to, um, at least in Occupy. And it's, it's just a very insurgent, sort of unique phenomenon. So how? How do you how do you cut work to cover that? How do you um, how does that uh, fit into your research? Well, certainly from the policy side, I mean this has been um, just uh, wonderful to watch. Um, I've written about inequality and issues facing working families for you know 15 some odd years at this point, and um, things have just gotten much more attention. You can actually talk about inequality for the first time, um, yeah. pretty much during my entire career. I mean you used to have to sort of you know, talk about poverty or other things, we go through different words, but it's been really gratifying to be able to, to sort of have that conversation. Um, for us, it was actually very well timed because we had already been working on this project, thinking about the impact of inequality on economic growth. And so we were sort of very well poised um, to, uh, to tap into what's been going on and to say, you know, this matters. It matters not just for the individuals who may not see the kind of opportunity because they're stuck at the bottom and they can't get to the top, or um, yeah, there's, there's a lot, there's not as much mobility, but that this has very pernicious impacts on our economy. So we've been, we've been just tapping into that each and every day. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, and this is particularly important for all of you, because I think this movement's going to continue on, particularly as the spring arrives, there's going to be a big boost to like sort of street activism and actions. Um, it's just, I think, paying attention to what's happening in local communities has been really fascinating. I mean, we, um, not only the, the direct actions by Occupy Goose, but just the different things that people are doing based around inequality. I mean, there was a story about a, uh, uh, a sheriff's deputy and some movers who refused to kick a woman out of her home in Atlanta, which is where I'm originally from. And I think that story got like 200,000 hits or something like that. And I just picked up on like a local news story, and I had some friends who were in the uh, who are in the local Occupy Atlanta group. And you know, things like that, I think, are really waking people up. And not only are we reporting about the actual actions themselves that are really popular, but I think a lot of what journalists are doing and what policy analysts like Heather are doing are providing the philosophical background for Americans about inequality. Because um, you know, no one likes inequality. And if you look at all the polls, all, almost you know, like 60, 70% of Americans do think we're too unequal. Like it's, like it's huge numbers. But what we're doing is we're giving a, a real face to that inequality and really putting the numbers before people because they're more interested in those numbers right now than they have been for decades. And so I think, you know, I just made a post like, uh, you know, top five facts, you need to know about the top 1%, just showing how unequal the country has gotten. And I think that post was huge. Like, I even saw it on a sign, in a, on a protester's sign. They, they had, like, reprinted the article or something. Um, but, you know, do, yeah, exactly. Um, so I think, you know, both reporting about the gravity of the actions and just reporting about the issue, both of those things have exploded. And doing both, I think, as uh, we go into the spring, is incredibly important for all of you in your local communities as, as these actions ramp up again. Great. So I think we're going to open it for questions. Anyone have any questions about political journalism? How to navigate these murky waters? Um, I guess I'm wondering how you write about political stories that um, focus on more so a message, not necessarily an opinion, but you're trying to show a perspective of a political argument that not a lot of people are showing, but still be like a news printing. Like you don't want it to be features or opinion. And how do you keep it news, but also have a distinct um, message to it? Because I, I wrote a paper, I not paper, an article about, um, I titled Progressives Fall, and it was pretty much about the past fall that progressives had. It was kind of just like a play on the words, all the scandals that we were going through and like what we plan on doing next fall or this fall in the political season and people liked it but a lot of people were like it doesn't belong in the news section like how do you balance that or figure that out i don't know 
I feel like pieces like that, which are sort of talking about a narrative, are really well done in sort of a long form type format. And I think what really makes it news and what would establish it and even give it credibility is just talking to a lot of people. You know, for example, if you're talking about, um, I wasn't quite sure what your, your topic was, but if like, let's say you were going to talk about like what's going to happen in the fall as far as progressives are doing, what you might, what you might do is you might talk to people in like local unions, uh, student groups, um, faith leaders, people who are planning to do things based around those issues, or you know, even if you have professors who study social movements, um, you know, if you put enough quotes in there, really what you're doing then is you're making a long narrative piece, and that certainly is a, a legitimate news item um, to, be, to be placed in there. Um, for Heather, I find it a lot of times it's hard to find, or at least for me, with a very limited economic knowledge base, to find good progressive economic sources that I can find online, like economists that blog, and you could recommend just some sites that we get to follow. Yeah, so, um, so there's a lot out there. Um, I certainly start off most mornings by reading Krugman's blog and Calculated Risk and Simon Johnson. Um, a lot of that's sort of on the macro, but calculated risk is fantastic because he just puts up the data every day so you know exactly sort of what's going on. That's not necessarily from a progressive, but that's sort of just like just, just the data. Um, and then for thinking about the intersection between politics and um, the economy, um, uh, Mark Toma, who's a professor at the, at the University of Oregon, he's in Oregon, but uh, I can't remember what school, um, and Brad DeLong and um, there is just a long list of other folks. Most of them I follow on um, Twitter, actually, which is really helpful because then um, I sort of have a whole section with all these economists and their blogs so that you get all the pieces. Um, I was actually just right before this working on a, a blog post for Think Progress um, about inequality and um, discovered this new guy with a, this new person that I had not discovered before named Miles Kobach, who's a Canadian professor who has this great blog on mobility and inequality. Um, a lot of the, you know, you get a lot of faculty members who will just blog like once a month or once every few weeks about what they work on, and those can be really insightful and super helpful. So, um, but Brad, but Brad and Mark Toma tend to send out like top posts of the day, so they'll send out like things that have like 20 posts in them, and that can be just super helpful because then you kind of get a sense of where to start. Oh, and I read Think Progress every day too. <laughs> yes. Um, I'd like to hear both of you talk a little bit about sort of uh, the relevance of you know this criticism of the mainstream media as corporate media, and then how that plays into the sort of uh, narrative of you know the last thirty years or so. As you you know, we have this this inequality that's been growing, and you know we didn't talk about it until about two months ago, and we still don't talk about it as the upward redistribution of wealth. We still just talk about it as oh look, there's this gap, right? So how does the sort of corporate influence in mainstream media uh, affect this narrative and how it's really uh, viewed in the eyes of you know, policymakers and people across the country? Well, I'll start. I mean, I'm sure that Seth has more, has more things to say on this than I do. But um, one of the things that I have noticed over um, the time that over the past, I guess, 12 years since I've been in Washington is the decline in journalists that actually cover specific um, uh, areas uh, that, that have specific areas of expertise. I can, I mean, I think Steve Greenhouse, who's at the New York Times, is, is the only reporter now that I know by name who has a labor beat. Um, I'm sure there are others, but um, when I started here in Washington, there was like a long list of people that had a labor beat, and now it's like, if you want a labor story, you call Steve, and then maybe other people, because they'll have it with like 22 other things they're covering, but they don't have that sort of depth of knowledge, and um, and that to me is one. I mean, it's a great tragedy because you don't have people that are dedicated to covering issues. Um, there's very few reporters. I mean, there's no one at the New York Times now that actually covers trade and trade policy. So um, there were all these uh, cases that have come down over um, the past few months about um, consumer protection, the the, the the dolphin safe tuna labels that we see in our cans, these voluntary labels. The WTO has ruled that they're illegal, and so we have to sort of pare back our, our legislation, um, if, and, or, or the United States has to appeal it, but there's no one that you could point to at the New York Times whose who's beat it is to actually cover those kinds of issues, and that's that's a real tragedy, and I mean, blogs are great, and the political reporting stuff is great, but if you don't actually report on the facts and the news, then it's all just, you know, then it's all just ideology, so I find that to be enormously frustrating. 
So it's just become an echo chamber? I, I, I worry about that because it does feel like, um, well, I mean, the other thing on this, I guess I did have a lot to say on it. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing on this is that when I first came to Washington, you could go to the press club and do a big event on a report and people would come and you could sort of get attention for doing something substantive, doing a substantive report. Really since the mid 2000s, um, that model of getting ideas out there just doesn't, um, doesn't work. So you can still get people to cover new, um, new data, new research, new ideas, but the process is different and part of it is that there just aren't, there aren't people whose beats it is to do that. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, I'm not an expert on this topic, but I think one thing also that's a play is a vicious cycle. For, you know, for example, Americans become more unequal, right? So that means that the people who rise to the positions of power and influence in the media also tend to be disproportionately trended towards some one sort of, you know, one sort of wealth class. And obviously, you know, when, when that happens, they'll be less sort of sympathetic to your issues. Um, you know, sometimes it's just a matter of, like, you know, your corporate media. So, like, for example, I don't know how much you guys are following the issue around SOPA. I mean, have you seen a single TV news story about SOPA? No, because all the companies are for SOPA, right? So sometimes that's just the case. On the other hand, you know, a lot of times it's just the case that uh, journalists are somewhat ignorant. I mean, the people who go and work in television and media mostly go, come from J school. They haven't studied a lot of other topics. They're, they, it's not like they have a bunch of economics under their belt or a bunch of like international affairs courses under their belt. And um, you know, you have to you have to reason with them and you have to sort of try to educate them and get them, force them to cover a lot of issues that they you know, otherwise uh, wouldn't cover. But yeah, I think that the vicious cycle is what scares me the most. And I think, actually, just to plug Think Progress, Think Progress has made a big effort to sort of hire on interns. I mean, Sarah was an intern of ours, and uh, we, want, we want to hire interns from all over the country. And uh, you guys should apply for the summer, by the way. Um, and particularly people from like public schools and people of, of uh, you know, sort of low income, racial minority. We try to get as diverse of a team as possible. And I don't think a lot of the rest of the media does that. Um, I don't, I don't think they mind too much if they have a bunch of people who look like superstars and come from the upper middle class and don't know that much about what they're talking about because ultimately they're, they're driven for profit. You know, they're not non-profit journalism like what Think Progress is or ideological journalism. So, well, and along this, that just to, to riff on that for a second, that um, the the fact that so many journalists come from elite backgrounds also then skews the stories in particular ways. So, as an example. Um, one of the things, I, I did a paper that came out about a year ago with, a, with a, another economist named John Schmidt, and one of the findings from that paper is that one in five men who have a college degree earn less than a typical high school graduate. Getting the media or um, sort of elites to focus on that when all of them have college degrees and cannot imagine that that wouldn't be a, a good investment for their kids, and of course it is probably a good investment for their kids because social mobility has declined, but understanding why for one in five men, that actually may not have been the best decision, and they spent a ton of money to get there. The numbers are smaller for women, but there's, so, which is, there's a whole bunch of other factors there, but that kind of story and understanding that is something that I, it's been really hard to pitch and to get covered, and some of it, I think, has to do with just the people that you end up talking to about the story. So uh, any just sort of general advice for young journalists about to emerge into the world uh, or, you know, still living, oh, we have one minute, so, you know, 30 second blurb, uh, <laughs> ready to go. Uh, just the first thing, go to campusprogress.org, you know, just to plug that, because uh, <laughs> I'm all, I only got to where I am today because of Campus Progress. I, I got grants from them to start student magazines, I went to all the conferences, I actually met like the second in charge of Think Progress there and introduced myself to them and eventually was interviewed for the job. So. Definitely utilize Think Progress and uh, try to write in as many outlets as you can. Just keep writing. Just keep at it. You never know when something's going to break through. And uh, you know we have far too much uh, talent out there waiting to be utilized. I think than we actually have people who are in, currently in the journalistic business that are doing any sort of good work. So I definitely encourage all of you all to keep to keep it up and keep up the good work. I don't think I can add anything to that. That was great advice. Um, <laughs> that was great advice. Do all things Campus Progress all the time. <laughs> and you will succeed. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, guys.